Thank you. Max, I think the uh, standing ovation was for oh, you, not for me. Standing O. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> cool. Well, it's good to have you here. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Yeah. Like 8, 12 hours, 12 something hours. like that. Yeah. So, uh, nonetheless, um, so uh, you've founded three companies. Um, you founded several, more than three companies. Uh, PayPal, Slide, Affirm, Yelp. That, that doesn't even count. That one I don't count as. No, there, before PayPal, there were many more that just... You have three, three notable companies. How's that? Three survivalists. Uh, you've, you've been on the board of Yahoo. You've been on the board of, uh, of, of, uh, of Yelp, of course. And um, you, know, you were a senior executive at Google. So you've seen a lot of different um, organizations and what works well and what doesn't work well, both in management and leadership. And that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. Um, and I think one of the most topical uh, areas of focus right now is around diversity and inclusion. Um, I think this is an area where your thinking has changed over time, um, or at least the, the saliency of it has increased over time. At PayPal, there were over 100 employees before uh, the first woman executive was brought on board. Uh, at a firm, Huey, you brought her on board as COO, as I think the fourth employee. What, what have been some of the differences that you notice is that have flown from, you know, that greater level of attention? So the, as w it, it is now a topic, and I think Emily Chang, who wrote a very nice book about the, the problem of lack of diversity and inclusion in Silicon Valley was here earlier, but my own, ex my own story, which is in part documented in the book, so I'm 20, Two, twenty-three 23 years old, we're starting PayPal. My job is to build an engineering team. We go build an engineering team, and the way you do it when you just graduated college is you go back to your alma mater and you just vacuum as many bright people as you knew during school. It so happens that if you went to a good university in computer science in the 90s, probably generally an accurate statement is most of your classmates were men. And so I hired 20-something dudes from uh, University of Illinois, and we built a nice team out of it. And so on and on it, it went. At no time, you, there's possibly anyone in the um, PayPal management team that thought, hmm, we really shouldn't be hiring women, or yeah, it would be really great to have a non-inclusive organization. That, I mean, I'm sure these people exist, but they didn't exist at PayPal, and quite confident they generally, there, there's not that many of those. That, that isn't enough, though. The, the, the way my thinking has evolved over the years is you can't just kind of sail through recruiting and building a team, building a management team, and kind of go, well, hey, I haven't found any, so you know, I'm, I'm doing my part. That, that's not at all doing your part. The Silicon Valley as a meritocracy is a local maximum optimization problem. You, you look around, you see the people you know, it's mostly men, mostly computer science students that you know, and you hire the best, and you think, hey, it's really meritocratic, it's, it's great. However, if you don't make an effort to bring on women, bring on diversity, or um, underrepresented uh, communities of folks, you're always going to be in the box of only the people that look like you that you already know because of where you grew up, where you went to school. And so at a firm, we made a very, very conscious effort to not just ask the question, hey, are we hiring the best people we know, but are we hiring the best people we don't know? Are we going far enough out of our inherent networks. And the, the thing that sort of I, I really want to stress, the best way of building an inclusive, inclusive company, diverse company, is taking it from a highly pragmatic point of view. If you go out into the communities of people that are underrepresented, there's a meritocracy in there as well. There's someone who is not a part of anything Silicon Valley who is the absolute best and brightest, possibly best and brightest in the world period that has no exposure because this place doesn't naturally recruit in that group. That is the greatest pool of untapped talent that you can find. And so going out farther and farther into the areas where Silicon Valley normally doesn't recruit, pays dividends if you're thoughtful about it, and if you make that a business objective. So we think we've done really well. Um, as you mentioned, Huey is one of the earliest hires and first, uh, first woman executive for a firm. We now have a few more. Um, 
And also, uh, as I recall, uh, one of your first engineers was African American. Your very a first founding engineer was, uh, he's even more complex than that. He is a Brooklyn born Dominican dude who also happens to be uh, African American in, uh, in his ethnic makeup. But uh, he's six years later, he's still with us and uh, serves very nicely as an example for those considering a firm as frankly, a proof point that we're not just paying lip service. I mean, one of our founding engineers, one of our most important kind of a pillars of the technological development, it does not look central casting Silicon Valley, which is great. Um, so how, how do you go about doing that? What, what, like specifically, what are some of the places that you go looking beyond the University of Illinois to go find uh, a more diverse workforce? So no, even the University of Illinois, not to sort of trash my own alma mater, um, it's fairly subtle changes, so I'll, I'll, I'll connect the two points very easily. So when I went back to U of I to recruit for PayPal, I went to not just to University of Illinois Computer Science Department, but to where I knew the best and brightest were, which was the Association for Computing Machinery, which is it's a big professional society for computer scientists, but every chapter, every campus has a chapter, and I was a big, very active member of our chapter, and so I went in and recruited people that looked like me because that's what it looked like at the time. Today, when I go to university recruiting, which I do all the time, I make it a point of priority to stop by ACM, and sometimes you find a very diverse organization, other times you don't, but you can do better. You can go and meet with Society of Women Engineers. You can sit down and have lunch with Society of Black Computer Science Majors. Every one of them has a slightly different name, but if you make it a point of saying, hey, I want to meet you. I'm not necessarily here to just recruit you. I want to know what your experience has been like. What are you thinking about? What companies are you considering? There's a lot of really interesting texture in those stories that are not told at all and that actually make some of the diversity and inclusion efforts difficult, even if you mean the very best. For example, there are plenty of people who are the first generation to go to college and therefore first generation to really make a significantly more money than everyone in their immediate family. Their point of view is, I really shouldn't join a startup because the salary is typically a little bit lower and I don't really understand this equity compensation. So a big part of what we do is we go out and say, look, we will work with you so that you, to make sure you understand the compensation structure, to make sure that you feel comfortable about joining this company, that you will fulfill your family's, you know, the, the, the faith they've placed into you when, when they probably scrape together money to send you to a really good school. So just getting out there is important. The other thing is you have to make it very clear, and for part of these conversations, something like this, you frankly have to be out there and say, look, we want these candidates. That We're not just waiting for them to come, we're going to them and asking them to consider us. And these days, the good news is that there are plenty of choices, plenty of companies that are sufficiently aware of the situation that they're trying, and so there's a lot of choices, and you actually want to compete for these uh, diversity candidates, which probably not what they're used to 10 years ago. I think one of the things that's really um, notable is that it's you that's going to these campus recruiting events and speaking at these, uh, at, you know, in front of these groups, because uh, it really demonstrates the commitment that the company has at the executive level. This isn't, you know, any, a campus recruiter that reports to a, a recruiting manager, that reports to a HR director, that reports to the VP of people, that right. reports to the reports to the, that finally gets up to the CEO that's showing up on these campuses. Um, it's the CEO and the founder, and I think that does actually send an important message to candidates about the importance of, uh, of, of their campus and their candidacy um, you know, to the company. Yeah, it's certainly, um, it, it, it's certainly part of my agenda to go meet with these clubs, even if I have some sort of a large speaking engagement before or after. I, I found those kind of a small group, three people, five people conversations to be much more effective in, in finding the connection and making sure that people take away the message that we mean this and we actually want to see the needle moved as opposed to just make sure we check the box. Yeah, um, and, and equally having the successful people in the company mm -hmm. as, um, you know, as, as existence proof that uh, you know, um, people from diverse backgrounds can be successful at the company, whether at the executive level um, or you know, simply a long time, um, you know, uh, employees that have, that, are, that have the kind of the respect of the organization. Yeah, I, I think anybody doubts that our first engineer is 
one of the most important contributors and still active today. So I think that's a, it's a great existence proof, as you put it. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing that's been quite um, topical has been this idea of um, you know, Uber and the culture that it, that it generated because of its tolerance for brilliant assholes. Um, so I'm sure you've worked with your share of brilliant assholes in your time. Um, you know, how has your thinking evolved on the impact that those sorts of people can have on an organization? There's definitely one, I, I've seen my fair share of, of brilliant assholes. It's a little bit more complicated than brilliant check, asshole check. It, it, it's more nuanced in a sense that a lot of times you find people that are, are unafraid to speak their mind, to get into it, to sort of really pile on the criticism. If it comes from the place of passion and ultimately is bracketed by respect, I think that's worked in the past and I think that still works today. If you step over the line of turning a conversation into essentially throwing insults at the person as opposed to their idea, it's sort of the beginning of the end. Like, there's certain capacity every organization has to put up with a brilliant asshole who's just going to say mean things about you because they're really trying to criticize your idea. But then it starts fraying, the, the, the edges of the the fabric of the organization really start fraying fairly quickly. And pattern recognition takes over reason, where people say, oh, I know what you're going to say. You always say this. And it actually comes both ways. People that are nice, people that are brilliant assholes, they start substituting logic with, oh, you're, you're just terrible at these kind of things. And that breaks down communications. And then the only way out is you have to manage the person out of the company. And um, unfortunately, the some of the brilliant assholes that have been immortalized in Silicon Valley and beyond as successful managers, successful leaders of companies, have contributed to this bizarre, absolutely false inverted causality of, if I'm an asshole, I might be brilliant. In fact, I must be brilliant, which you, know, you, you see way too often. One, that's not true. Just because you behave really badly does not make you that much better. And if you're really smart, behaving badly doesn't make you smarter. And that's probably the single most common pattern where I had to kind of go, this is my first and last conversation. I think you're doing this because you think you're smarter than everybody else. And by showing off that you are, it, it's, it's going to give you more credibility in, in your organization. Next time we have this conversation, it'll be with an HR person in the room. And this will be your last conversation here. And I've had to manage people out, as they call it, and or fire in this context where it, it hurts the company if below the layers of brilliance and complexity and assholeness and whatever else, there's a lack of respect for the other person. Like that, that's the part that really breaks it. Words are words. It, it doesn't ultimately matter that much if you walk out of the room thinking, I think you can do your job better than I can do your job. If that trust is in there, it's, it's just a, a way out. And so that's, uh, I think that's, that's a really interesting perspective. I, I think that a lot of the brilliant assholes um, behave the way that they do because they think that they can um, and that you know, their, their, their job performance is sort of cover for it. And at some point um, when that no longer becomes true, um, you know, that they, they figure out there's other ways to behave. I, I used to work in entertainment. Um, earlier in my career, I was at uh, USA Networks before it became IAC. And um, that behavior is pervasive in the entertainment industry, and it starts with the talent. You know, it starts with the demands for only red M&Ms in the green room, and you know, I've only, you know, if I'm flying, I got to fly private, and I got to have to take three or four of my friends with me, and all that sort of stuff. You know, people are behaving that way because they can, and it permeates from the talent to the executives uh, because they look at those the talent and say, well, if they can get it, why can't I get it? And um, and I think it's really um, what, what, it was one of the things that attracted me to the technology industry relative to the entertainment industry is that, um, you know, at, at least at that time, um, the, the, there really wasn't that tolerance for that sort of behavior. I think in general, I mean, as much as the brilliant assholes get a lot of airplay, Silicon Valley, for all its flaws, is one of the places where humility is generally prized. I think people like working for founders that, you know, fly 
economy and wash their own dishes. And there, there's a bit of an esprit de corps that develops around, especially in teams where everybody knows everybody. If you're, if you're there burning the midnight oil with the team, that leadership by example goes a very long way. And so sort of being a brilliant asshole is absolutely not a necessity. I think that that's a myth that can't die too soon. Well, I think this is one of many examples of how leadership flows from the top. Um, and that, uh, you know, everybody's sort of taking cues from the founders and the CEOs and their behavior. Um, it's sort of, uh, like, it's one of the most effective tools of management is your own example. Um, can, you, can you actually talk a little bit about a time that you were very thoughtful about an action you took or didn't take because of the example it would set for the rest of the organization and, and how you wanted to, you know, the performative aspect of, of leadership? So I'll, I'll spare the exact details because the company's still ongoing, but you're already on the board for this one. So a couple of years ago, we had a bug in our system that cost us a little bit of money. And uh, it did cost us a little bit of money in a grand scheme of things, but at the time, the upper boundary was not yet defined. It was unknown. I so remember. walking into an executive meeting and being told by your head of risk and your head of engineering. So we had to screw up, and uh, we know it's at least hundreds of thousands of dollars maybe millions, maybe tens of millions of dollars that we will never see again. So as a lender, you only make a tiny spread between the principal and principal plus interest, but you can lose the totality of the principal. And so the downside is significantly worse than the upside. And so my initial reaction, I mean, it's one of these things where you're like, I trusted you guys, what the... And it's a small group, it's you know five or six of us, and we're all kind of bracing for impact. And, I was about to blur that out because it doesn't happen very often, thankfully, and you have to kind of let go of the steam. I said, well, I know these guys are stressed out. So this was over Valentine's Day 2016, and so, so it's two years. Um, and uh, I basically bit my tongue and thought, you know what I need to do? I need to show these guys that we're going to come together and figure this out because I don't know if I have the solution in my In fact, I don't have, I have a solution in my head, but so I don't even know if we survived this one. But if I project this oh my God, hair on fire attitude. I know they're already there. They were here all night trying to figure out what's going on and they still don't know. I have to turn this around and say, okay, doesn't matter whose fault it is. Let's, let's get on top of this thing now. And at the time, it was like one of these two and a half seconds where I was like, okay, we're going to get, and, and we did and we solved it and it was very, incidentally, Huey, the, the first female hire and female executive was extraordinarily instrumental in solving that one for us. And, uh, a she year did, later. She did it. Interestingly enough, she did it without the reliance on technology. Yeah, this was like a human effort. It was kind of amazing. But uh, long story short, so this is also like, you know, I, I didn't put this under the, I led by example today, check. But a year and a half later, there was some sort of internal survey around sort of leadership within a firm and how we're doing and et cetera. And apparently the story of Max kind of going, okay, now we're going to come together as a team and fix this became like a minor legend where people, somebody in the room told someone else in the room and said, hey, we're this, you know, I, I, saw, I saw the guy in charge, he, he swallowed the hard words and moved right along and we're all going to have to do it. And so it came back to me as an example of that was really inspiring behavior apparently. So ever since then, I've been quite good at going, is this the part where I lose it or is this the part where I actually going to go like, okay, everyone, time to come together. So I'm, for what it's worth, it, it works. It worked for me. I, I can also readily admit to not always being so good about sort of pocketing the angst and, uh, and, and not letting it out. I mean, cu culture flows from the stories that people tell, and the stories people tell come from these instances because um, it tells everybody else like how it's okay to act and how it's not okay to act. Um, I think we're seeing that in the White House today, you know, where uh, like leadership is coming from the top and everybody looks at that and says, oh, it's okay to do these things. Um, to not tell the truth, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think we, we, we as leaders need to be very conscious about the, uh, um, the, the precedent that we set uh, because it does it. Everything flaws. Everyone's watching the leaders and everyone's watching how it's okay to act. Um, Every part of this is televised now. Yes, indeed. Um, you know, this actually brings me to, I think, the last question uh, that we'll have time for, which is related to what you just talked about, and this is the whole concept of founder attention. Like, the things that the founder pays attention to, they get done. The things the founder doesn't necessarily pay attention to, they may not get done. Can you, can you kind of give me an example of a time when, you know, founder attention really 
when focused, solved an important problem that maybe wasn't getting enough attention before? So this is a, an old story, but it's a, probably one of the most formative stories of, uh, of my career. So right after PayPal and X.com merged to form what became the combined PayPal, it was a very, very tumultuous merger. It was a 50-50 merger, which I do not recommend. If you don't know who's in charge, everyone's in charge, and there's a lot of hand-to-hand sort of -hand combat. And um, I was kind of the junior founder. Peter and Elon were the CEOs of the two companies. I was a CTO, so I was a little bit protected. I was also younger, so not, not as involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So I busied myself by, because I'm, I'm nerdy, reading our books. So I started sort of going through our accounting books, or just basically the balance sheet and a, and a cash flow statement for the company, just to educate myself. And um, I thought something was off, and I sort of asked a couple of questions of the accounting team, and they gave me some numbers, and I had never taken an accounting class. I was a complete neophyte. And uh, it just felt like there was something not quite sort of looking really right as to what I expected but no one seemed to be all that worried. And at a time, I was thinking, well, if no one's worried and I don't have any accounting background, it's okay. But I kept prodding because I, I was curious. About a month later, I began to understand and sort of roused people around me that fraud, which became a legendary scourge of PayPal, which later on a lot of us were intimately involved in combating, basically left us about six weeks of cash flow. Like we, we would have been straight out of money, six weeks or less. If so what was happening? What was this fraud that was happening? Uh, this was, so PayPal was growing its processing volume very, very quickly. And a lot of those transactions were being done by organized crime and various fraudsters from all over the world using stolen identities and stolen credit cards. And so when somebody uses a stolen credit card as a processor, PayPal was on the hook for all the money. And so you process someone's $100 payment, just like my example about loans, you pass a $100 payment, the person whose real card was being used without their knowledge says, hey, that's not my $100 charge. They charge a chargeback, the credit card company re refunds the transaction, the merchant of record, which is, was PayPal, is on the hook for the money. So as we were scaling the company exponentially, so were the bad guys scaling the milking of PayPal of, its, uh, of, of money it didn't have. And as you pay back these chargebacks, it comes out of your cash. And so even though we just raised the very large, I think it was an $80 million round of financing, we were very rapidly bleeding money out. And the, you know, I, it's one of these things where you can only run the experiment once. Had I done nothing, maybe we would have survived. Maybe the company would have been dead. But um, one of the sort of moments of, of my past where I kind of look back and say, I'm very happy I was just obnoxiously persistent enough to go keep digging and basically cashing in the founder prerogative chips. They're like, hey, 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 I started this thing, so you gotta teach me. And I'm sure a lot of these people are basically telling me like, look, you, you really don't need to dig into my work. But it was really about forecasting what turned out to be a very fast growing exponential function, while everyone who looked at it initially was saying, well, yeah, it's growing a little bit, but you know, whatever. Chargebacks are delayed between 60 and 90 days. Mm -hmm. So you don't get to see your losses unless you're forecasting them. And if you think the forecast looks like this and it looks like this, you can find yourself in very bad trouble very, very, very unexpectedly. So that was, a, that was an important uh, founder prerogative uh, story, I think. Right. Good. Well, thank you, Max. Uh, this has been terrific. And the audience will join me in thanking Max for sharing some of his perspectives. Thank you.